Hi Year 5, I'm going to be reading you chapter 5 of our book Anglo-Saxon Boy and we've got to the part where Magnus and Hakon have arrived in the city of York to see Magnus's uncle Tostig. Chapter 5, Bought Men. A warrior stepped forward to stop them as they clattered beneath the gatehouse arch and into the street beyond. He was in mail shirt and helmet, a sword in a scabbard on his belt and a spear in his hand. Beyond him were a dozen more mail shirted guards with spears and axes, two of them holding big war bows, barbed arrows notched and ready to fire. Magnus halted his horse, Hakon staying close. Apologies for the arrow, my lord, said the warrior in Danish. His voice was friendly enough, but his eyes were cold and hard. We've been having a bit of trouble with the locals and my lads get twitchy, especially after the sun goes down. Think nothing of it, said Magnus in the same tongue. Everyone in the Godwin family was brought up to speak Danish as well as they did English. His grandmother Geetha wouldn't have had it any other way. Where can I find my uncle, the Earl? Why, in his palace, of course, said the warrior. I sent one of my lads to tell him of your arrival. You just need to head down this street, cross the bridge and... I know where the palace is, Hakon said. Do you now, said the warrior, turning to look at Hakon with narrowed eyes. So you've been to Jorvik before, have you? What did you say your name was? I didn't, said Hakon, spurring his horse on again. Magnus and the others behind him, the gatehouse guards staring silently at them as they rode past. The street was lined with stone-built Roman houses on both sides, although their roofs were thatched like country steadings, and more recent wooden dwellings were squeezed in any gaps. At the end of the street was a river with boats tied up on both banks. Magnus counted seven as they crossed the bridge, three of them long ships. Beyond the bridge was another street that took them past a big church with a tall square bell tower and wooden doors twice the height of a man. Magnus realised it must be the Church of York's Archbishop, who was nearly as important as the Archbishop of Canterbury. There were many people around in this part of the city, but most hurried inside when they saw them coming or just stared coldly. The sky was almost dark now and shadows were creeping over the city. Magnus thought it felt like a place full of ancient ghosts and a shiver crept up his spine. They came at last to a second gatehouse, this one leading to a courtyard in front of another large building. It must once have had four storeys, but the top floor was missing and a more recent roof of wood and thatch sat where it should have been. A line of warriors stood in front of the doorway, some of them holding torches. Hakon halted his horse and jumped down, and Magnus and the others did the same. What do you think, Hakon? Magnus said quietly. I've got a feeling they've had more than just a bit of trouble. It's almost as if the city is under siege. Yes, and they should never have let us in that easily, said Hakon. I might have been lying, but then you can't expect bought men to have any brains. Bought? How could you tell? I thought they were my uncle's sworn men. Your uncle does not have any sworn men, Magnus. He is not like your father. Men do not serve Tostig out of love, but only for the gold and silver he pays them. I have met many bought men in my time and killed my fair share as well. Magnus felt a wave of anger at Hakon's words. This was not the Tostig he remembered, a strong, good man and loving foster father. Who are you to speak of my uncle that way, he said. He is a lord and you are nothing but a sworn man. I am your father's sworn man, Magnus, said Hakon, not your uncle's. A young warrior interrupted them. Earl Tostig bids me welcome you to his city of Jorvik, my lord, he said to Magnus. Your men will be well taken care of. The earl awaits you in his great hall. Magnus scowled at Hakon, but the housecarl shrugged and said no more. So Magnus tossed him his shield and followed the warrior into his uncle's palace. The great hall was a long wide chamber with a beamed ceiling and a central hearth and it took up almost the building's entire bottom floor. There was no fire in the hearth, just grey ashes, 
but candles of all sizes stood around the ancient walls or on the ledges of the high shuttered windows and they cast pools of warm yellow light that seemed to make the deep shadows in the corners even darker. A group of guards stood at the far end and Magnus could also see several priests in long black robes. Somebody was talking, the words English, the voice raised in anger. What do you mean you can't make them pay? That's what I pay you for. They're peasants and you're supposed to be hardened warriors. Maybe I should send a few of your priests to do the job instead, Eldred. The young warrior pushed through the men and Magnus followed, removing his helmet. Magnus had recognised the voice as that of his uncle and now he saw Tostig sitting on a throne-like chair. His green tunic was of the finest cloth and he had a heavy gold chain around his neck and gold and silver rings on his fingers. He was bigger and fairer than Harold, his hair and moustache almost corn yellow. People often said Tostig was the most Danish looking of all the Godwins. It had been three years since Magnus had seen him last, at a Godwin gathering, where Tostig had been his usual loud, cheerful self. Now he was scowling at the men in front of him. He turned to Magnus and smiled, though, and leapt to his feet to grab him in a bear hug. Magnus, is it really you? I can't believe how much you've grown. You're practically a man. And what in God's name are you doing up here in the wild north? Tostig partly released him, but left a steely arm slung round his shoulders. Actually, you can tell me later. First, I want you to help me convince these fools I'm right. They're supposed to give me advice, but all they do is argue with me. I hardly think so, my lord, somebody said. We are merely trying to help. Magnus looked at the man who had spoken. He was old, fifty winters or even more, and his hair was thin and grey. Like all priests and monks, his pale face was clean-shaven, but he was wearing the rich robes of a high churchman, a long blue silk gown with crossed embroidered on it and fine black cloak. He too wore a heavy chain around his neck, although his had a large gold cross hanging from it. Magnus, meet Eldred, Archbishop of York, said Tostig. Eldred inclined his head to Magnus in greeting, and Magnus nodded. He knew most people would have knelt to kiss the ring of the office the Archbishop wore, but his father had taught him that was something a Godwin would never do. So, Magnus, Tostig went on, will you help me? It was strangely unsettling to hear his uncle ask him the same question as his father. Magnus hesitated and looked uneasily round the circle of men, all of them now staring at him, waiting for his answer. I will if I can, uncle, he said. Good, said Tostig, nodding. I think it's simple. You need money to run an earldom. You'd agree with that, wouldn't you, Magnus? Of course, said Magnus, shrugging. And the money should come from the taxes paid by the people, said Tostig. The taxes that I set as the Earl of Northumbria, their lord. That's fair enough, isn't it? Magnus opened his mouth to answer, but Tostig kept talking, his voice rising again. He glared at the men in the room, his gaze clearly making them uncomfortable. And if the people refuse to pay their taxes, then I have the right to make them. My lord, you know there is more to it, Eldred said softly. Tostig let go of Magnus, strode over to the archbishop and stood looming over him. He was a head taller than Eldred, but the archbishop didn't flinch. There is not, Tostig said, the words hissing out of his mouth. I am the rightful lord of the north, and I will not allow anyone to take my earldom from me. Do you hear? Times are hard and the people are unhappy, my lord, said Eldred. I'm sorry to say this, but you are making them hate you. The more farms your men burn, the more rebels you will have to face. You are doing your enemies' work for them. Tostig said something in reply, but Magnus had stopped listening, his mind suddenly full of horror. So it had been his uncle's men who had burnt the farm he had seen earlier that day, and his uncle had clearly given the order. We will speak of this no more, Tostig roared at last, silencing Eldred. You men will just have to do better, do you understand? Come on, Magnus, you must be hungry. We will eat in my private chamber where I don't have to look at these wretches. Magnus glanced at El Archbishop Eldred and their eyes met briefly across the hall, but Tostig was rapidly striding away and Magnus turned to follow him. He could hear the other men already whispering behind him.